do Shibidi-doo. Ben Morrison and perhaps one of his best known uh, tracks Have I Told You Lately That I Love You and um, he plays the Barbican in York tonight a legend in the business but is notoriously difficult to pin down if he wanted to try and pigeonhole his style it's even harder to obtain an interview as uh, Van Morrison avoids the media glare offering uh, often um, refusing point blank to talk about his work one man however who is willing to talk about Van the Man is Dr Peter Mills senior lecturer in media and popular culture at Leeds Metropolitan University and author of Hymns to the Silence Inside the Words and Music of Van Morrison. I spoke to Peter earlier and asked him what it was that fascinated him so much about Van Morrison. One of the many uh, interesting things about Van Morrison is um, the way he's, his work has kind of unified you know, the, the classic American forms of, of popular music, you know, blues, jazz, uh, country music with a very specific British and more than that Northern Irish kind of musical sensibility. So it's a very unique mixture of, you know, sort of different cultural inputs, different musical inputs, different styles that when you kind of mix them all up together, something very characteristic comes out. And add on top of that, is anybody who listens to him for a couple of minutes will realise, you know, what an amazing singer he is. So just the sound of his voice, you know, setting aside all the, the cultural stuff, yeah, it's, it's very, just the sound of it. It's very strange. You talk about this blending. I mean, if people say to me, well, you're you going on about Van Morrison again, Jonathan. So what is he then? What style does he sing in? And I find myself saying, well, it's R&B, it's soul, it's sort of mystical music, it's Celtic music, it can be jazz music, it can be the most romantic love song you've ever heard. It's very, yeah. very difficult to categorise him. It is. Uh, and he said an interesting thing once. He wrote uh, an appreciation of uh, Ray Charles for Rolling Stone magazine and he concluded it by saying that whenever he listens to any kind of popular music he hears Ray Charles in it he said it's all Ray Charles music now because Morrison really really you know kind of worshipped Ray Charles and I think you can kind of say the same thing about his musical style that all these inputs that we're talking about end up being absolutely and unmistakably him you know it's Van Morrison music um, so I think I think that's you know if you're looking for a term to describe it, you know you could say well there's a bit of blues, there's a bit of funk, there's a bit of jazz, a bit of country, a bit of folk, it, almost like sort of show tunes sometimes. You know there's R and B in the you know the old fashioned sense. All these things are going on, but what comes out the other end, you know what you hear is absolutely uniquely and distinctively Van Morrison music. Yeah. What's Van Morrison's music like? Well, it's like Van Morrison, and if you can't understand that, then you can't <laughs> take it any further. He started yeah. out, you talk about show tunes. Didn't he start out playing in the, the sort of famous Irish show band style? Mm, he certainly did. Well, I mean, the, the very f- his very first musical sort of exploits were in uh, a number of um, skiffle groups in Belfast, um, because that, you know, that was the style of the, the time, kind of the mid-50s. Then he moved on to, uh, as you rightly say, the show bands. And one of the distinctive things about the show bands was their ability to play in any style. So, you know, they could play uh, a traditional Irish tune or they could play, you know, a Muddy Waters cover or they could play a Lonnie Donegan tune or they... Do you know what I mean? All these styles were within the repertoire. They were required to, you know, be able to reproduce all these different styles. Turn up, an event, um, turn up at an event as the show band and do what the organisers required. Yeah, exactly. Crowd pleasing, isn't it? Brilliant. Yeah. And um, people, yeah. people may know. People will perhaps be familiar with Van Morrison's one of Van Morrison's earliest hits without realizing that he's there because he is them or he was in them mm-hmm. singing Glo- right. singing Gloria, which he, he yes. actually sang within the last couple of years when he was on uh, later with Jules Holland. Yes, yes, he did. I mean, that's been a kind of an ever present. He has a a kind of changeable relationship with some of his most famous songs because sometimes he just gets fed up of doing them, I think. But Gloria is a song that's always been in there and has gone through all sorts of different kind of incarnations. You know, it's we've had very, very long kind of, as you you were saying earlier on, sort of Celtic mysticism versions or very, very short, tight, punky versions or almost kind of borderline uh, comic versions. But it's, it's almost like sort of the benchmark for him and you're quite right you know um i was familiar with some of his solo stuff 
for several years before I realised that he was this, you know, shouty young kid on Gloria and um, Baby Please Don't Go. So you could easily not know that it was him. And he sort of, I mean, from his Irish roots, he also had a time in America, didn't he? Because there's the time mm. of a song uh, called Tupelo Honey, which yeah. is real sort of laid-back Woodstocky sort of feel. Absolutely right. I mean, it was, you know, th that was the, the era, you know, the early 70s, the singer-songwriter thing, and as you say, it's absolutely right, a kind of that Woodstock feel to it. Um, although it's a Californian record, you know, he, he lived in uh, San Anselmo in California rather than Woodstock, which is sort of, you know, upstate New York, it's on the East Coast. But yeah, he definitely fit into uh, that scene, the singer-songwriter scene. And uh, it was diff it was separate from it in that, you know, his, his music had a more of a raw edge to it than somebody like James Taylor, perhaps. But he definitely found his audience in America. He was much more popular in America in the 1970s than he was in the UK. Uh, his albums, you know, used to sell five, six times as many copies in, in the States. And then he, t I mean, this very same man that's capable of making that kind of music will then turn up on stage with the Chieftains um, yeah. and just blend perfectly. Yeah. Well, at that time, uh, he'd come back to uh, Europe. He'd, he'd sort of left America and he was, he was living in, in Bath, actually. Uh, and he'd also just uh, bought a house uh, south of Dublin. So he was kind of getting back into, um, you know, his Irish roots, I suppose. There was a TV documentary around that time in which he said, well, he'd, he felt like he'd been searching and searching and searching for the tradition that he belonged to, you know, a place musically that he could really belong. And suddenly he discovered um, that actually the tradition he belonged to was his own, the one that he'd come from. And this was, you know, kind of a real revelation for him. And that's where the, the Chieftains Project came out of that kind of discovery, you know, a rediscovery of these songs that he'd heard when he was a, a, a kid living in East Belfast um, in a very musical neighbourhood, actually. There's a, a famous Irish musical family called the McPeaks were neighbours of the Morrisons, and, uh, you know, he used to hear the McPeaks you know, just, just playing around people's houses in, in, in Belfast. And then, of course, he, he bowls up... Um, with a hit record with someone like Cliff Richard. I mean, this is the essence of the man. He's the sheer flexibility and the fact that for someone who is notoriously grumpy, it has to be said, and uncooperative with anybody that wants to write his biography or anything like mm. that, or uh, anybody who wants an interview with him, he's mm. actually, when it comes to his music... Um, you know, one minute the Chieftains, the next minute Cliff Richard, one minute something really laid back and sort of mystical and funky, the next minute he's up there like uh, some, one of the, the great rhythm and blues singers of all time. He's a complete musical chameleon, isn't he? Uh, that's a very interesting way of describing it. Um, I'd qualify that by saying it's not in the way that, say, somebody like David Bowie is, you know, where he'd be, like, experimenting with different styles. Um, somehow all these things are, are, are always... Um, going on together in Morrison's music and sometimes periodically you know the jazz element will rise to the surface or the country element will rise to the surface or the Irish element will rise to the surface and that becomes the kind of the you know the dominant style on any given record or in gigs or uh, any you know sort of particular phase of his career so I think all those things are going on all the time I don't think he picks a style up and then puts it aside and does this other thing you know, there's kind of an ebb and flow between them and they're sort of informing each other all the time. Just to sort and, of sort of place him in the pantheon of musicians to, to mm. do with their wealth. Um, mm. I remember reading uh, a few years ago, there was one of those Sunday Times type lists or something like oh, yeah. that, that at that time he was worth, I can't remember whether it was 47 or 56 million pounds. Mm. If, anybody, so if anybody's got this idea that he's a sort of jobbing musician that wanders around the place, we're talking about a mm. multi, multi million air whose music is lapped up by people the world over in, in the first instance um you know that that's, that's richly deserved wealth as far as i'm concerned but you know i i suppose i'm uh, biased in that way but um what he's always been very good at and what he worked out very early on is that the the music business well actually this there's a phrase that he came out with which i used as the kind of um little sort of introduction to my book on him, Hymns to the Silence. Um, music is spiritual, the music business isn't. And he's, he's attentive to both sides. You know, the, 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 uh, the, spiritual, the spiritual element, that is the creative element or, you know, the art element, however you want to describe it. 
that's there in the music. But he's also very attentive to the business side because he knows how the music business works. He's been in the music business, you know, 50 years, maybe even longer, whatever it is now. Um, and he knows that the music business is always skewed against the artist in favour of the producer, the record company, the advertiser, you know, whatever it happens to be. And very early on, he took, you know, control over his own business affairs, basically. Well, he's, he's, um, he's knocking on 70 now, isn't he? I think he's 67 or something 67, like that. 67, yeah. He's heading in that sort of... Um, I'm just wondering how long he can possibly continue. He's recently had some, some sadness in his life, hasn't he? He has, he has. But I, I think that Morrison will be like these old the old blues players, you know, the Muddy Waters and the BB King. Uh, I can't see him retiring from performance. I think that he will actually just, just do it and do it and do it until, you know, until he drops, really. One actually, I think I can't see him setting it aside. <laughs> One thing everybody sort of who follows Van Morrison will know is uh, this alleged grumpiness and the mm. fact that um, you can never predict what he's going to do on stage. No. People will go to the same concert in the same tour and apparently come away with completely different impressions. Sometimes he will choose to play 45 minutes or an hour if he's not mm. really feeling in a good mood. And then if the spirit falls upon him somehow, mm. you could be there all night long. He's a bit like Ken Dodd telling jokes yeah. after the last bus has gone. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. I've never made that comparison, actually. I mean, uh, uh, to my shame, I ducked out of a, a, a Ken Dodd gig after uh, <laughs> after two and a half hours when the interval came. I thought, I, d I, I can't take another two and a half hours of this. But um, in terms of Van, you're absolutely right. I've been to see him and I've come away and I thought, you know, I've, I've felt quite sort of bereft because it was such a perfunctory and, you know, kind of listless uh, performance, you know, for 75 minutes. And then other gigs that I've seen, I would rate them, you know, as, as not only the, the best gigs I've ever seen, but, you know, some of the most, you know, just marvellous musical moments I've, that I've ever had anywhere. So you don't know what you're going to get. And sometimes I think that he doesn't know what's going to happen either. Sometimes it might just be, you know, the way his voice falls on a certain note or something that the, the, the keyboard player does that just switches it on for him and then, you know, he's on to another level and then something interesting starts to happen. Well, fingers crossed, if you happen to be going along to the Barbican tonight, that it's a classic Van the Man uh, performance. That was Dr Peter Mills, Senior Lecturer in Media and Popular Culture at Leeds Metropolitan University and author of Hymns to the Silence, Inside the Words and Music of Van Morrison. BBC Radio York.